everyone. We're here today with Dan Reardon and Glenn Becker from the Penfield Volunteer Emergency Ambulance Services. A lot of people don't realize the full scope of the services that PVEA provides, so I thought it would be great if we could just have a conversation. And so Glenn and Dan, thank you for sitting down with me. Thanks, sir. Um, thank you. Maybe just starting at a high level, can you talk about what services PVEA provides and who you serve? Sure. Uh, well, PVEA started uh, back in 1966 um, when some of the local residents uh, got together with the Lions Club and the Lions Club raised $15,000 for us to put together um, and purchase our first ambulance. Um, and we did about 160 calls that year. Contrast that to this year, um, when an a fully equipped ambulance um, cost us about $250,000 uh, with all the medical equipment, the stretchers, the stair chairs, the backboards, the life packs, everything that goes into that. Um, and we'll do 6,600 calls, maybe 6,700 calls this year. Wow. Yep. Um, so that's a a big change over 55 years. Well, uh, certainly as the town has grown, you've had to grow with it, right? Exactly. Okay. So we have six ambulances. Uh, we built this building back in the year 2000, um, and we have kind of outgrown the space. Um, but uh, we can talk about that more later. Sure. Um, but the services that we provide, obviously, emergency transport with the ambulances um, to uh, neighboring hospitals. Um, in, the, in the Rochester area, um, and even sometimes down to Newark and uh, Thompson, uh, if the residents want to go down, if it's a resident of that area get, who gets injured in our town, we would drive them down to the, to the hospital that they want to go to. Oh, wow. Yep. Um, and um, other services that we provide on top of that um, for the community are, we do a number of standbys for town events, whether it's a concert series or um, different events that the town sponsors, as well as we do uh, monthly blood pressure clinics at a couple different areas, a couple, a couple different spots in the town. Uh, we um, also help out at um, football games um, and parades and, and other community events. So we do those, and then uh, we also offer training. We've got a uh, training room here in, the, in our building, and we offer free CPR to town residents. But in addition to that, we do other EMS-related uh, training for our own staff and neighboring staffs, as well as we can customize training and do other trainings, AHA trainings, for instance, for Stop the Bleed, um, uh, other uh, what we call alphabet um, classes, which are specific to the medical industry, and we can tailor those to, for the different businesses in the um, community as well. So it sounds like, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's not just emergency transport. It really is um, extremely community-based. You push into the community to educate people about skills they might need. I'm assuming CPR, stop the bleed, things like that. Right, exactly. So monthly, uh, first Wednesday of every month, we do a community CPR, and then we add on to that, depending on how many people have gone to our website and requested the CPR. We add additional trainings as necessary. Most of them we do here, but we'll also um, go out to other um, uh, locations in the community and customize and, and be on site for them. So Dan, tell me about the blood pressure clinics. I did not realize that those occurred. Yeah, we have four or five um, senior living communities in the town of Penfield, okay. and we have a group of dedicated volunteers that at least once a week will go to those li senior living facilities. Mm -hmm. um, some are also independent living, and a couple hours, like a Tuesday morning, um, they'll go there and they'll sit with the resident, ask about their health, take their blood pressure, um, and it's great for the resident because they get to know some of our providers, um, get to know a little bit of what we do, and at the same time, um, they're monitoring their health because those places are independent or senior living and they may not have that day-to-day -day care like a nursing home would. So it's just a nice service that we provide. But if somebody was not in one of the senior independent living centers, could they come and get their blood pressure screened? They can, 24-7. Um, again, with high call volume, there may not be a crew here, but with the manager here, 
um, a lot of our volunteer administrative staff. Uh, the community comes in often. I think we probably do two or three blood pressures a day here on site at 1585 Jackson Road. Um, and the community is always welcome to come in and um, we'll check their blood pressure. We'll even if they want, we'll check their heart rate, put them on a pulse ox. Um, and uh, that, that's always open to the community um, as long as somebody's in the building. But sometimes we do get busy and they may not be here, but they could try again in an hour and Assuming you'll come back, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And once a month we're, um, we're, you guys actually host us at uh, the library rec center um, and we do them there as well. Well, you, you just touched upon something that I wanted to pursue, which is a lot of people think that PVEA is actually part of the town, town of Penfield government. That's not really the case. No, exactly. Um, we start, as I said, we started in 1966 as a not-for-profit. Um, we're still a not-for-profit. Um, most of uh, our funds come from billing Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance. Um, we get um, a small percentage of our revenues um, from supported from the town. Um, I think it's going to come to within the next year or so. Uh, it'll be about ten dollars per household per year is what is contributed to us by the town and then we do a fund drive with the residents every year and that accounts for I think maybe another two and a half percent of our operating budget is what we get from the community through our fund drive okay and we're also not part of the, t the fire department uh, that's common in most uh, a lot of areas is that the fire is that EMS is provided by the fire department and uh, Penfield Beck you know, 55 years ago, went in a different direction where we are a separate agency. Uh, we work well with them and um, we also do some cross training with them, um, but we're not part of the fire department. How many paid employees do you have versus volunteer? Could you talk about that? And Currently today we have 19 full-time employees, um, two of which are managers, myself and our chief paramedic, Dustin Mendel. Um, and then we have 10 um, full-time paramedics and eight full-time EMTs. Uh, and with our other employers, employees, we have um, 22 per diem employees um, that work in a kind of backfill and offset what the volunteers and full-timers don't do. And then for volunteers, we still have about 40 active volunteers, um, some of which are still on the road, some of them do administrative work. Um, some of them are upon, on committees or they serve on our um, volunteer board of directors. Which is interesting because volunteers would obviously decrease your operating expenses, right? You rely on volunteers to provide a lot of service. Right, they save us anywhere from $250,000 to half a mil a year in salary, just what they do from an administrative level, whether it's working with our billing company and looking at all the charts, um, or whether it's they're doing maintenance for the building, um, or if they're driving an ambulance to our mechanic, or if they're just providing road staff. Uh, we're very lucky, maybe, maybe the most fortunate in, in the region where we still have you know, about 100 to 120 hours a week of volunteer road participation of um, our drivers and EMTs. And we even have a volunteer paramedic, um, maybe the last in the region uh, that still does um, several road shifts and standbys for us. Wow. Yeah, we're very, very fortunate. And we're trying to hold on to that for the future. Um, you know, volunteerism is, is important to us. It's a major part of our history. Um, and who we are. Uh, I think I can attribute that our employees, about half of them started here as volunteers. Um, and it's a big thing we look for when we look for employees is that they do volunteer at other organizations, whether it's a volunteer fire department, if they're a part of Kiwanis, you know, somebody that can really adapt to our culture where we do have the spirit of volunteerism um, and they're okay to work with that or they still do that on, in another forte in their life. And some of our volunteers, the young volunteers that are coming in, um, they're not only from the Penfield community. Uh, we have people coming in from Brighton and from the city that come here to volunteer and get into the industry. Okay. And then we've seeded into Monroe, AMR, all the surrounding towns. Some of our young people have gone off and taken jobs in those areas, in those other communities and those other companies. Um, and that's one of the, I think that's one of the community things that we do is we encourage and build them and, and get them cleared as EMTs. So, so, so that they can go into a career as well. Yeah. One, of the, one of the most rewarding things I've noticed over the last, my 10 years here is watching certain individuals make this their career, kind of like myself, 
but then watching individuals out there that have gone on to med school and are now doctors or PAs or RN, BSRNs in the community, or they're a career firefighter and they're now a lieutenant or captain in um, another fire department in the county or law enforcement. Um, we've really been a great stepping stone for a lot of individuals that volunteer here or worked here when they're in college and now have an, an, an amazing career. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to you know, what they learned here at Penfield, the teamwork, the camaraderie, um, just bedside manner, working with patients. Um, so that's, that's been awesome and neat to see. And they come back and visit and we see how they've grown uh, from where they started here. It's, it's been a great reward. Dan, how does somebody get involved? So somebody wants to help out. Yep. We have um, a recruitment committee um, that handles it. Um, what I usually tell people to do when they call is to apply at penfieldambulance.org. Go to apply now. Um, but they are also welcome, if they're not sure, we do allow folks to come in and observe and they can ride along with their ambulances and with their crews and really see, hey, is this something I wanna do? They can learn a little bit about the educational requirements to be in an EMT or a paramedic. Um, it kind of gets their feet wet to say, you know, this is something that's for me or not, and we understand that may take time to discern, but um, we do allow folks to come in and, and observe and ride along and get to know our crews before they make that decision. I mean, once they apply, we're, we're very quick. Um, our recruit, recruitment committee is awesome. They're usually in touch with you within 48, 72 hours. We get you in here for an interview, and then by the time of our next monthly board meeting, um, which is the second Monday of the month, uh, we're voted on them as a member, and within that week, they're on an ambulance learning how to be an EMT. But it sounds like it's not just limited to that too, because you said that you know you have volunteers for things like maintenance, absolutely. Some of some of your general committees, so yes. it isn't like somebody has to be right. an EMT yes. to volunteer. Yep, we were right. always looking for um, administrative help, so we are more than welcoming, especially over the last five to ten years as we've grown as a a small business, really into a medium-sized business. I'd say now as a nonprofit, is anybody in the community that wants to provide administrative support, if they have a background in HR, if they have a background in information technology, if they have a background in um, financing or um, financial planning, um, we welcome any of those um, field, any of those types of fields to come in and support us. And they don't necessarily have to become an EMT. We have a lot of administrative support, but if anybody wants to come in um, and provide that um, subject matter expertise and volunteer their time, um, we are more than open to allow them to come in and help us with those tasks. Yep. Probably one of the other things we should touch on, another route in, um, is we have a very active explorers group. Um, and we, again, in, in that explorers group, we have um, young people in there from not only Penfield, but Webster, Williamson, um, Arondequoit, the city. Um, yeah, so what do the explorers do? Uh, so the explorers do ride time once they turn 16. Okay. Um, they can do ride time and ride along with us. Um, uh, our lead in that is uh, Bowden, and uh, Bowden does monthly drills with them where they actually learn hands-on first aid, and then we'll use them um, in the rigs to do some some very light some kind of, some of the first aid, you know, help with bandaging, help with splinting, that kind of thing. Um, they write along with us, they may write down demographics, that kind of things as well. And they really get a feel for what it is to be in this industry. Um, I think two of our, our busiest volunteers last year, most out, or last month, um, were former explorers who then became EMTs and joined. So um, that's a nice route in here. Um, they also do some social kinds of things. Uh, they come and help at community events. Um, and um, they also have been involved with Boy Scouts and Girl Scout uh, troops in the, in the town of Penfield, helping them uh, through providing uh, medical training so that they can get their, um, their merit badges in first aid as well. How many explorers do you have currently? I think, 12 active? I think the current number is 12 to 15, yeah. Okay. Are there a lot of explorer posts in Monroe County, or is this one of the few? Uh, for EMS, this is one of the very few. Um, I think there's, I would have to double check with Bowden, but there were three or four, and I think one or, one or two of those might have closed. So this oh, wow. is, there's not a lot of uh, opportunities for, for people to do that, and that's why we're, we're drawing some people from outside okay. the immediate town. One of the questions I've always uh, wondered about is what's the difference between ALS and BLS? Because you provide ALS. 
We provide both. Oh, you provide um, both. You want yeah. to do it or you want me so, to do it? So back to our history in 1966 when we started, over those years, um, SCQ, Southeast Quadrant, was our advanced life support provider. They were ran a fly car service. Um, so anytime a call was dispatched that required a paramedic, SCQ came to the scene with us and worked with our ambulance crew and then, if needed, transported to the hospital with them. And in 2017, we made the decision, um, did a whole analysis on our future and made the decision, hey, we're gonna be able to go um, ALS on our own, independent from SCQ. Um, Parrington did it a year before us and we kind of followed suit. And since then, we've been in ALS um, in service uh, since 2018. What ALS and BLS is, is the big difference is BLS, you hear of EMTs, um, emergency medical technicians. ALS is your paramedics, your advanced life support. Biggest difference is, is your BLS providers can obviously work in AED, give oxygen. Um, we can give Narcan now for overdoses. Um, we can give epinephrine for an allergic reaction. A paramedics um, can honestly do under our medical director's orders um, everything ba basically an ED can do. Uh, they can give an IV, an IO, IM. They can do. Uh, they can monitor you and give you a four liter, a twelve lead EKG. Um, they can push drugs. Um, I think they have a tackle box of about thirty medications that the same thing an ED would have. Um, and they do have narcotics that um, you know can help somebody with their breathing or could help them um, with their heart rate, whether it needs to be higher or lower. Um, and we do have the ability to, with our monitors, um, part of outfitting ambulances are monitors that can do the AKG, but it can cardiovert um, somebody um, to change their heart rate uh, mechanically through electrical activity through our monitors like an AED would to either give them a higher or lower um, heart rate. So it's, it's a, Paramedics usually about an 18 month, 12 to 18 month educational process. Um, what usually through MCC or FLCC and an EMT program is about three to four months. Um, uh, it's the biggest difference is, you know, the amount of training that goes into a paramedic and they have to do a lot of ride time, a lot of hospital time. And an EMT is just, you know, one semester and usually 10 hours of observation in an ED or an ambulance. So you've talked a little bit about the rapid growth of Penfield and just keeping up with that growth. What other challenges are you seeing out there? Yeah, um, kind of twofold. So one in, in just the growth area, um, as I think I, I mentioned, we, um, we did a major renovation to this building back in 2000. Um, and we're now at the point where we're looking forward so as I said, we've got six ambulances. Um, we only have four bays here, oh. um, plus one for the fly car. Um, so we have um, another one of our rigs is um, sitting up on Gravel Road at West Webster Fire Department. Um, and that allows us to better cover the Northwest segment of, of the town of Penfield. Um, so that, that gives us a spot for one of them. Um, the rest of the, the time, uh, if we're not doing, have a, if we don't have a rig out for just regular routine maintenance, which with six, you often do, um, that um, is sitting outside here in the summer. Um, in the winter, Penfield Fire has been kind enough to let us park um, inside one of their bays um, the last several years. Uh, but um, we've been working with an architect to figure out what what we need for the next 20 years. Um, and um, so we're looking at building out on this building to the north, which would allow us to put in appropriate living space. You know, we have four crews on during the day. Um, the space was really designed to have one crew sitting here. Um, on the overnight, we've got two crews um, and we've got three bedrooms. So that's four people. Um, and so, uh, we turned one of the offices into a uh, off-hours bedroom. Um, so uh, we're trying to, to build appropriately so that they, they have appropriate accommodations what, so that if they're not on a call on the overnight, they can get a couple hours of sleep. Or uh, if they're doing a 12-hour shift in the morning when the other two crews come on, they can catch a couple hours of sleep as well. So, because um, we want them to be alert and ready to respond. Sure. So, um, so it's important to have the right accommodations for that. So that's gonna be an expensive addition that we'll put on um, and we'll have to uh, do some kind of fundraising associated with that in the next couple of years. So that's one challenge is just growing and, um, 
and being able to handle the call volume that we've got. Um, more recently with um, COVID, um, paramedics and EMTs, um, a lot of them have retired out of uh, the community. Um, not so much here at Penfield itself as in just in the industry in general, um, as well as with the shortage of people at the hospitals. Right. They've been augmenting their staffs with paramedics who, as Dan was describing, can do IVs and a lot of uh, medicine administration. So that has um, drawn people out of um, paramedic jobs to go into higher paying jobs in the hospital, which is great for those people. Um, but it's created a real national problem with staffing. Um, and that has flowed into the Rochester area uh, where there just are not enough paramedics to go around. There are not enough EMTs to go around. So uh, maintaining a good staff is difficult. Uh, last year we had to give about 20% raises to much of our staff to get them in line with what other agencies in the area were doing to maintain staffing. So that's one of our big challenges is um, having a good work environment here. Um, when we went ALS, we added a retirement, a uh, simple IRA plan. Okay. Um, we added medical for our full-time full staff. Uh, so it really becomes something where um, it's an industry where it was difficult for people. You had, really had to love what you were doing to stay in this because the remuneration for EMTs and paramedics was not adequate to keep people doing it as a career. And um, we need to step that up and provide those additional benefits. And that's not inexpensive to provide health care, um, a contribution to health care and uh, a little bit for retirement uh, to these folks and, and give them a living wage. But I think what's really interesting is that um you know, you're providing so many things, and yet the property owner is basically paying just under $10 a year for, exactly. all, for all the services. I know you're subsidizing with other things as well. Yeah, so we do bill insurance, okay. um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, um, and private insurance. Um, one of the additional challenges is the fact that Medicare and Medicaid doesn't actually pay us um, a rate that um, meets the, our average cost of responding to a call. Okay. Um, Can you give an example? Um, yeah, so uh, it costs us about 350 to $400 to have, you know, the expensive equipment and the manpower here to meet the 95 plus percent response rate that we get give to the community. So Medicare and Medicaid uh, only pay 250. It's a fixed rate. Medicaid's around 180 to 250, and Medicare's around 400 to 500 dollars per per transport. Right. So for us to do that, then uh, we build private insurance, and that's some of the reason why you see private insurance rates are so high, is because to some extent that subsidizes the large percentage of our community um, that is on Medicare and Medicaid as well. And that large part of the community of being Medicare eligible has really grown. So if you look at American population demographics, World War II, 1945, those baby boomers, um, you know, shockingly, it's came up fast, you know, are turning 75. Um, and all of a sudden they have a greater health care need and sometimes that requires an ambulance. So when we saw only 3,000 calls 10 years ago, obviously taking on a little bit of growth in the territory. Uh, but if you look at the number of senior living communities, independent living communities, nursing facilities, urgent cares, doctor's offices, especially in Penfield, um, there's a demand there. Um, and that demand has grown immensely. And if you look at population charts, it's probably 15 to 20 years before that demand starts to decline a little bit. Um, granted, medicine and technology will help us with that and helps us with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We do go to private residential homes, but about 50% of our call volume is either in um, a skilled nursing facility or senior living or a doctor's office in urgent care. Um, so that's going to obviously continue to grow as the town continues to grow. And it's been our job, and I think we've done a great job, is to meet that demand and growth over the last you know, 10 to 15 years. One fifth of our call volume um, is mutual aid into other communities. So last month, I think about 120 calls were on either Webster, Parrington, Brighton, or Rhinocoit. We even went as far as Hamlin last month, um, and we even sometimes support the west side towns. 
So with tying into your question about the aging population um, and the Medicare and Medicaid costs that we want, um, another thing that, that we do, um, which most of the neighboring agencies, nationally most of the agencies, um, bill for what we call public assists. Mm -hmm. So uh, the nursing homes and a number of the residents here in town um, that have um, medical, ongoing medical issues, um, often we have to go out, uh, especially, seems like especially on the overnights and between six and eight in the morning on what we call lift assists or public assists, um, and just help somebody to get back up and uh, get back into bed or get back into their chair because they've fallen. Um, most agencies bill several hundred dollars for that. Um, we have tried very hard to maintain our billing rates where we do not bill okay. for yeah. public assists, and that's about 10% of our volume um, is going out and doing that. Um, and sometimes that turns into um, a transport, but most times it's just a lift assist um, or checking their vitals. Um, and we don't have to do anything more extensive than that. So um, we encourage people to call 911 if you need us to do that. We'll come out. We're staffed 24 seven. Um, and we have no problem coming out and doing that. And sometimes that turns into a um, Dan um, going out on places where we repetitively are going out to a residence. And sometimes it turns into Dan helping them to either talking through you know, you need um, some rails, you need some assistance um, uh, in, in home, or advising the family, you know, maybe they're at a point where they need to do something more ex extensive with assisted living, you know, go into an apartment someplace where they have folks that'll come in and do meals and that kind of thing for them, um, which is always hard for... That's a hard conversation to have. I mean, yeah. you're, you're pushing into the social work. Yeah. yeah. Aspect so, of the job. And sometimes Dan talks to them and sometimes Dan refers them to the social worker that can help them get those services that they need. So, um, so it's important for us to go out and do those things even though we don't get paid for them. So what other community services does PVEA provide? Yeah, we have a loan closet, um, again, open 24-7 as long as crews are here to answer the door. What, what is a loan closet? Yeah, it's uh, walkers, canes, and crutches. Okay. Um, and, you know, doctor's offices are pretty familiar that we do have those loan cupboards. So do other ambulance corps. Um, we do not have wheelchairs. We get asked that often. Um, and we will take um, from the community if somebody's moved out, you're having a garage sale, um, please think of us. If you have walkers, canes, and crutches at home, we will look, gladly take those donations. Um, but if somebody in the community um, needs a walker, cane, or crutch, um, we will gladly provide. We have a great supply of them. We haven't really ran out. Um, so our door is always open for walkers, canes, and crutches. Thank you. Now, how does somebody get more information? Uh, good question. So um, obviously they could stop by here, um, but probably easier for them is online. They can find us at penfieldambulance.org. Uh, they can also find us on Facebook. Um, and uh, if they want to just find out more information, they'll find that on the website. Uh, if they want to apply to volunteer or uh, if they're an EMT or paramedic and they want to apply for uh, a paid position, um, applications are on that same website. Um, we also have hard copy here uh, if you're like me and uh, a technophobe. Um, and then if they want to get involved with the Explorers, um, probably best is to call here and we can uh, take a message and, and get the Explorer advisor to respond back to them. Okay. Uh, if they're looking for training, uh, they should reach out to uh, our phone number, 872-6060, um, and ask to uh, talk to our chief paramedic, uh, Dustin Mandel. He also runs our training. Um, and as I said before, you know, it's everything from the monthly CPR that we give for free to residents. If they need some advice on getting um, an AED into the community, because um, obviously with CPR training, uh, the sooner people are trained and someone that's trained can get started or an AED becomes available. Um, Dustin can also give them advice on um, acquiring that um, and getting trained on that as well. So. so on behalf of the town of Penfield, please um, accept our gratitude for all that you do and all that your staff does. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today and I've learned a lot. Um, I hope that People will feel free to reach out if they'd like to become involved with your organization. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.